Welcome to Elevens is with Lisa. I'm so happy you're here. <clears throat> I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and needless to say, 2020 has been a bit of a trying year, hasn't it? And it's not over yet. Um, but at the center of every year is family and family history. And later in this episode, I'm going to give you an update on what's been happening with the Cook family around here and how my daughter Lacey is doing. Thank you so much to all of you in the live chat who've been um, so wonderful in sharing your thoughts and prayers for her. I have good news for you, so we'll look forward to doing that. But <clears throat> first, I wanted to share um, a cup of Christmas tea with you. Gosh, we do this every week. We've been doing this since um, back in March of 2020. And I, I, I love meeting with you every Thursday morning at 11. And for those of you who meet with us via video, that's cool too. Uh, it's on your schedule, and we're just so happy that you're here. Um, the book, A Cup of Christmas Tea, just seemed perfect for our little family here. It was written by Tom Haig, and it's illustrated by uh, Warren Hansen. And it's a simple, heartwarming story of how one man's reluctant visit to an elderly aunt's house really renews his holiday spirit and brings him some unexpected joy. And the book debuted way back in 1992 on the New York Times bestseller list. Not exactly an overnight sensation. It was already in print for 10 years. But once it hit that list, boy, it was on there for three more years, which is pretty unprecedented in the world of publishing. And to date, this book has become a classic. It has sold more than 1.5 million copies. Charles Kuralt once said, Quote, I have a feeling that this little green book will be around for a long time, raising lumps in throats and smiles on faces. To it, I raise a cup of Christmas tea. And many of you have been sharing with me as well how much you um, have enjoyed the book, which is kind of like a night before Christmas type poem with a very different story. And um, some of you I know have gotten the book since I first announced we were going to do this. So you're just in for such a treat today. Beth wrote in and she said, many years ago, I heard the author read a cup of Christmas tea on the radio, and I fell in love with it. We listened to his reading every year as part of our Christmas. And Dana, who's also known as Jean Buds in the live, in the live chat, she wrote in to say, I remember that story in Guidepost, sometime after my late mother gave me the book. Now, she sent me in a photo. Let me see if I can find it here. Oh, yeah, here it is. I love this. She says, uh, after her mother gave her the book, uh, very special memories are attached to it all. Later, she gave me the whole tea set. This morning, my husband got out our mugs for our ritual of morning tea and I took one look and I cried out, oh, no, 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 it has to be the special teacups. Well, grab your special teacup and join me with a visit with Tom Haig, the author of A Cup of Christmas Tea. Well, hello, Tom Haig. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Happy holidays. I'm so happy to be here. This is great. Thank you. Me too. This is a wonderful way to spend uh, Christmas Eve morning as we are here, but some folks might be watching this uh, thereafter. You have just written the book that just kind of sums up the heart of Christmas. It's uh, a cup of Christmas tea, and I've been telling my viewers about it. And boy, has this book taken off. Did you ever imagine that you'd be selling millions of copies and having people read it all around the world? Oh, goodness, no. It was going to be a poem that I read one time at my church, and that was going to be the end of it. But it had a life beyond that, much to my surprise and delight. It sure has. You know, I know many people have already gotten a copy. I've got my copy behind me, and I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and shared it with my family. But if somebody hasn't read the book, give us kind of the, I don't know if synopsis isn't the right word, the heart of it. What's this story about? I tell you what, why don't I read the story? Would you? I would love it. Okay, hang on. I've got my tea. I'm ready. <laughs> Take it, Tom. 
This is a cup of Christmas tea. The log was in the fireplace, all spiced and set to burn. At last, the yearly Christmas race was in the clubhouse turn. The cards were in the mail, all the gifts beneath the tree, and 30 days reprieve till Visa could catch up with me. And though smug satisfaction seemed the order of the day, something still was nagging me and would not go away. A week before, I got a letter from my old great aunt. It read, of course, I'll understand completely if you can't, but if you find you have some time, how wonderful if we could have a little chat and share a cup of Christmas tea. She'd had a mild stroke that year, which crippled her left side. Though housebound, no. My folks had said it hadn't hurt her pride. They said she'd love to see you. What a nice thing it would be for you to go and maybe have a cup of Christmas tea. But boy, I didn't want to go. Oh, what a bitter pill to see an old relation and how far she'd gone downhill. I remembered her as vigorous, as funny, and as bright. I remembered Christmas Eve's when she regaled us half the night. I didn't want to risk all that. I didn't want the pain. I didn't need to be depressed. I didn't need the strain. And what about my brother? Why not him? She's his aunt too. I thought I had it justified, but then before I knew the reasons not to go, I so painstakingly had built, were cracking wide and crumbling in an acid rain of guilt. I put on boots and gloves and cap, shame stinging every pore, and armed with squeegee, sand, and map, I went out my front door. I drove in from the suburbs to the older part of town. The pastels of the newer homes gave way to gray and brown. I had that disembodied feeling as the car pulled up and stopped beside the wooden house that held the Christmas cup. How I got up to her door, I really couldn't tell. I watched my hand rise up and press the button of the bell. I waited, aided by my nervous rocking to and fro, and just as I was thinking I should turn around and go, I heard the rattle of the china in the hutch against the wall. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch came down the hall. The clicking of the door latch and the sliding of the bolt and a little swollen struggle popped it open with a jolt. She stood there, pale and tiny, looking fragile as an egg. I forced myself from staring at the brace that held her leg. And though her thick bifocals seemed to crack and spread her eyes, their milky and refracted depths lit up with young surprise. Come in, come in. She laughed the words. She took me by the hand and all my fears dissolved away, as if by her command. We went inside, and then, before I knew how to react, before my eyes and ears and nose, was Christmas past, alive, intact. The scent of candied oranges, of cinnamon and pine, the antique wooden soldiers in their military line, the porcelain nativity I'd always loved so much, the Dresden and the crystal I'd been told I mustn't touch, my spirit fairly bolted like a child out of class and danced among the ornaments of calico and glass. Like magic, I was six again, deep in a Christmas spell, steeped in the million memories the boy inside knew well. And here, among old Christmas cards, so lovingly displayed a special place of honor for the ones we kids had made. And there, beside her rocking chair, the center of it all, my great aunt stood and said, how nice it was I'd come to call. I sat and rattled on about the weather and the flu. She listened very patiently, then smiled and said, what's new? Thoughts and words began to flow. I started making sense. I lost the phony breeziness I use when I get tense. 
She was still passionately interested in everything I did. She was positive, encouraging, like when I was a kid. Simple generality still sent her into fits. She demanded the specifics, the particulars, the bits. We talked about the limitations that she'd had to face. She spoke with utter candor and with humor and good grace. Then, defying the reality of crutch and straightened knee on wings of hospitality, she flew to brew the tea. I sat alone with feelings that I hadn't felt in years. I looked around at Christmas through a thick, hot blur of tears and the candles and the holly she'd arranged on every shelf, the impossibly good cookies she still somehow baked herself, but these rich, tactile memories became quite pale and thin when measured by the Christmas my great-aunt kept deep within. Her body halved and nearly spent, but my great-aunt was whole. I saw a Christmas miracle, the triumph of a soul. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch came down the hall, the rattle of the china in the hutch against the wall. She poured two cups, she smiled, and then she handed one to me, and then we settled back and had a cup of Christmas tea. That was beautiful. Now, see, I have the hot blur of tears. <laughs> How do you read it without tearing up? I mean, the, the picture that you paint as you speak, and like, I'm sure you've told as many stories and you've read it many times, but um, I can tell that it, it just feels personal. It feels personal to us listening, but is it personal to you too? Oh, very, very much so. The character of the great aunt was uh, based upon my two grandmothers who lived mm -hmm. with us uh, in a triplex. Uh, my maternal grandmother was on the third floor. My paternal grandmother was on the second floor. And they were very, very different women indeed. My grandmother on the third floor, my grandma Sully, her, her name was Jeanette Sullivan, uh, was not educated beyond the third grade. Mm. She was orphaned at the age of five. Uh, in a terrible way. Her mother was uh, um, a doctor, and they were in Chicago, and she was ill, de desperately ill, but a word went out to um, that, that a woman was delivering babies and was in difficulty, and she went. And when she got back home after delivering the baby, she fell down a flight of stairs in front of my grandmother, and she died instantly. Oh. And my grandmother was adopted by uh, a family that used her essentially as a slave girl, physically abused her, and um, she ran away at the age of nine to her sisters in a different city. She went from Chicago to St. Louis, and um, she lived there until she was 12, at which point she went up to Chicago and got a job as a hotel maid. And it was there that she mm -hmm. met my grandfather, Cornelius John Sullivan. And they moved after they got married. He was 30, she was 18. They moved to Minneapolis, where they weathered the Great Depression and had six children, five of whom survived to adulthood. And my paternal grandmother, who lived on the second floor, was highly educated. Mm -hmm. She was, uh, had a bachelor degree from the University of Minnesota, class of 1898. She was captain of the girls' basketball team when they had the baskets that still had the bottoms in it. You had the first yeah. thing. <laughs> and um, she and my grandfather, uh, Heg, uh, would correspond in several different languages while she was at the University of Minnesota and he was in a uh, seminary in Decorah, Iowa. And, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> I have to get a little bit of yeah, water. Yeah, let me get a tea. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> sorry. 
sorry about that. That's okay. Take your time. Um, they were ultimately married and they went into the ministry together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had very different experiences with my grandmother <clears throat> on the second floor and my grandmother on the third floor. But I, uh, as different as they were from each other, I was always absolutely safe, I knew, in their company. And that is why the aunt became who she ultimately became. She's a reflection of both of those women. What an amazing opportunity as a child to grow up with that kind of safety and security and love and just being it enveloped was. by grandmothers, you know, it's wonderful. And you really knew their story. So I think it's interesting for somebody who had such a traumatic story as your, your first grandmother that she mentioned did. Mm -hmm. You clearly know it. Did she share that very readily or what kind of conversation uh, I relationship? Found out of, I found out about all of that from my mother, not from her, because she had a very difficult time talking about things like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that whole story came to me by way of my mom. Well, and that really shows, gosh, you could be talking to somebody across the table <clears throat> and just not realize the kind of story that's there with them. That's you know? right. And uh, the need to inquire. And it sounds like they, they had quite an influence on you. Oh, and very you, much so. Well, and you certainly convey a real appreciation for a connection, particularly with elderly relatives. Yes. So that, of course, begs the question in my world is, uh, do you know much about your family history? Did that translate into an interest in family history? We were not able to find anything on my great on my, on my grandmother Sullivan's side of the family because uh, there was a fire apparently in the Hall of Records, and all of that was lost. Mm. So my grandmother Sullivan, uh, her background was rather a mystery to her as well because she was uh, orphaned when she was so young. Right. The closest thing that we could find out was that uh, she had been born in Germany, not the States. And she thought that she had been born in the States, but it turned out that she was born in Germany. Came over uh, at, during the Chicago uh, fire, which is what took the records. And um, so it's been difficult, very, very difficult to find anything at all beyond her generation as to who she was. There was always some sort of a talk about being related to some sort of a German baron, but mm -hmm. that's as much as I know about it. So it's a mystery. The other side of the family is a little bit better known. Yeah, the Hague? Yes, Norwegian. Ah. <laughs> well, you said that the grandparents talked to each other in the uh multiple languages was yes they uh spoke to uh, norwegian of course which was first language for both of them and in english and in uh latin they would wow. correspond yeah that way and uh that uh, uh thought didn't go into the next generation because uh my the generation that uh had my grandparents wanted all of the children to speak English. Mm -hmm. We're Americans now. We're not Norwegians anymore. Sounds like and my great-grandparents' so, house. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Very much so. Wow. So you mentioned that the, the great-aunt is kind of a compilation of the grandmothers. And, yes. Um, but, you know, you grew up with them... Is this, does this feel like a personal story for you as the young man, or, or was it just something maybe you saw in other people and how they responded to? Oh, you know, I, I learn a great deal from this story about the importance of going where you're needed and going where you should be. Um, I'm as guilty as the young man in the story for all of those thoughts that he thought yeah. about not wanting to go, about wanting to push all of that aside and have it easy. Christmas without much personal sacrifice or And you I have to say, as an author, my gosh, you captured that well. I was thinking as you were reading that part, oh my gosh, is he inside all of our heads? You know, we've all had mm -hmm. at some point that experience of, oh, I don't want to go. And then yet the best things can happen out of that. That's right. They do. Yeah. 
So what prompted the writing of the story? I mean, it, it's turned into, and I think I've, I've mentioned to the, the viewers, my goodness, you've sold a million and a half copies. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list, but I'm guessing uh, that it maybe wasn't the easiest road to get it there. Where did it start? How was this story born? Uh, I was asked by my church to do a reading of a Christmas story for the annual congregational uh, choir dinner. And uh, so I thought, well, why don't I try to write something especially for it? And I had ignorance working for me because I didn't know that I couldn't write. <laughs> and so it came to me over a space of three days uh, on a, on to a yellow legal pad. Wow. And on the first night that I read it, people kept on saying, you know, you need to do something with this. And so I did. I met Warren Hansen, who is the illustrator of the books, and uh, I got his number from the editor of Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, who said, yep, Warren's the best in town, but you'll never get him. And I read the story to him when I got him on the line over the phone. And after I was done, he said, I'm in. Well, and you painted the pictures, didn't you? I mean, even if you've never, and the illustrations are absolutely beautiful and they captured really so well. But my goodness, just in your own uh, words, you've painted a real picture. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I read somewhere um, that you have a, a theater background. That's something that we share <laughs> in common. Yeah, uh -huh. And um, certainly it makes it, uh, you, you a wonderful person just to read your story and the way you've just infused it with the feelings in the moment. I can tell you're in the moment. How, how does your theater background and play into this, moving into the world of being an author? Well, I played Charles Dickens at the Guthrie Theater in a production of A Christmas Carol. And uh, when I started thinking about writing something myself, the thought of Dickens having taken up his pen and written uh, uh, about a story that uh, probably became the best known of his canon. Mm -hmm. um, Christmas has a way of giving presents <laughs> to <laughs> people who are in that kind of uh, position and who want to do something uh, as far as adding to Christmas literature. So uh, I had the opportunity, I took it, and I got very, very lucky indeed. You created a little bit of luck, though. I was reading um, that you shared the story with some notable people, and one notable woman who I'm very familiar with her work uh, said, Hayes, tell Helen us about Hayes. that. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend uh, who knew her, uh, and um, he said, why don't you just drop her a copy? and see what she has to say about it. And so I did, uh, and I didn't hear back for six months because uh, I didn't know she lived in Mexico during, oh. the, uh, during the winter. And so one day uh, in the spring, I got a postcard from Helen Hayes and said that it filled, that your story uh, filled me with tears of joy. I hope you get it published. Helen Hayes. And if you're going to get uh, that kind of encouragement from the first lady of the American theater, oh, yeah. you're going to take that advice. Absolutely. I, I, couldn't you just imagine her playing the great aunt? Oh, absolutely. Oh, that She's would be just amazing. what I had in mind. I bet. So, um, you know, a lot of people are struggling to be connected and to see family this season. And what words of encouragement can you give them on Go. the importance? Yeah. Pay, pay, make that visit. I can't tell you how many times I've received uh, letters or calls from people saying, you know, I was driving along and this story called A Cup of Christmas Tea came on the radio and it caught my attention. I pulled over to the side of the road and listened. And then I made a U-turn and I decided to pay a visit that I had earlier decided I wasn't going to make. And that has made all the difference. So true. You know, Tom, we, um, a couple episodes ago, I, I had a viewer write me a note about being out on a genealogy research trip. And, you know, she started seeing some 
some family names on street signs and and she was just couldn't rummage up the courage to go knock on the door and her husband's like you know what are we doing this for if it's not to go knock on the door and she did and we did a little video of it and I thought there's so many opportunities it's not that they don't present themselves I think oftentimes we're the ones who kind of get in the way you know and it's oh yes yeah that's Absolutely. quite true well and you didn't let not being an author get in the way of writing a best-selling <laughs> book <laughs> and you've written more so I'd love to because you know this book is kind of um, a little more it speaks to the heart of, of adults I think and I think even young people uh, gosh I just you just want to send it to all your kids and your grandkids to give them that reminder that there are other people beyond you know just their generation and that everybody has a story to tell um, but you've also written for children yes and um, Tell us about how that came to be, because I imagine, you know, you had some success, so you had an opportunity to kind of capitalize on it, but it has a very unique theme. Tell us about your children's stories. Oh, Heath the Christmas Berry is the story of a little teddy bear that Santa Claus makes with his own hands, and he asks each of the elves to uh, bring their favorite piece of cloth to him, and he's going to sew it into a bear, so the bear is representative of everyone. He touches it, which is breathing the breath of life into it, and the little bear says his name, Peef, for the very, very first time. And um, Peef and Santa become partners, and uh, Peef helps him with all of the chores that he has to do as the Christmas season approaches and takes that magical ride around the world with him. Uh, but oftentimes, when he goes along with Santa, he hears a piercing squeal of purest joy and looks in a window and sees a little girl or a boy and a teddy bear together for the first time. And he realizes that his own destiny as a teddy bear is not to be on Santa's turf on the North Pole, but to be given to a child. And Santa ultimately senses that this is the little bear's heart's desire. And knowing that he may come to harm, <laughs> gives Peef away on Christmas at the last stop he's going to make. He says, Peef, how many years have I been doing this? A ton. I can't believe I'm short of toys, and yet I am by one. But there was something special in the tone of Santa's voice that told the little bear that this mistake was made by choice. And Peef looked up at Santa, and the old man looked ahead, his eyes alight with well, I'm not sure just what. Then Santa said, We have a special duty to the children, you and I. We can't forget a single one. You know the reasons why. We have to think of them before we think about ourselves. Besides, we have to set a good example for the elves. I guess that what I'm trying to say. Then he could say no more. And for a little time they sat together on the shore of Christmas Day that washed the far horizon of the night. And as the sleigh began to move again, a growing light began to glow against the inky canopy of sky until a bright aurora berealis filled the eye of heaven. Oh, the colors that adorned the Christmas air, all radiating from the heart of one small teddy bear. The little fellow peeped for joy. His dream was coming true, for soon a little boy or girl would say, Peef, I love you. And that's the story. Oh, it's just beautiful. Um, I love the story of how that came to be because uh, I was reading some notes on it, and you, you took 24 hours just to do nothing. And I thought, that's right. Th that's a hard thing to do. And yet there's magic that can come out of something like that. I hope I ho love to have you share that with people because I love how this came to be. Well, I uh, wanted to do a book for children and uh, for Christmas. And so I decided to take one day off completely during Christmas vacation. I'm a teacher, was a teacher by profession and lie down on the sofa and just look at the Christmas tree and, Christmas tree and let my mind 
wander, wool gather, go where it will. And I took a nap, and when I woke up from the nap, the outline for the story was in my head. Not the name of the little bear, but the plot line, and I knew what the story was going to be. And when Warren Hansen, the illustrator I mentioned earlier, first heard the story, he said, well, you know what this story is, don't you? And I said, well, what, what are you talking about? He said, this is the Christmas story. Yes. This is a father giving a son to the world, knowing that he is going to come to harm. Mm -hmm. and, and selflessly so. And that's, it's amazing how <clears throat> those things, those nuggets, those, I call them gems, they reside in all of us. Sometimes they we do. have to be quiet enough for them to be able to come out. Very, very true. The time that you spent thinking, meditating, contemplating is every bit as important as the time you spend actually writing. And you reached back into your own personal history a little bit to name Peef, right? P-E-E-F, Peef. Where did that come from? My brother is five years my senior, and he had a stuffed toy collection that was in place, the Kamito family, he called them, when I was born. And some of them had little squeakers in the tummy. And my brother Jimmy would say, Tommy, make the bear go peef. Because he decided that that squeak sound uh, was, if, when transliterated into English, was P-E-E-F. And so that's how peef got his name, from my brother Jimmy. That's awesome. That is so cute. And I think I see a peef behind you. Am I correct? So you Oh my gosh. There he is. So sweet. So I know that um, you have your books. People can actually get those for kids too, can't they? Oh yes. They are absolutely available. What, what's going to come next the next time you take a day off? And what are you going to be looking at? And what are you hoping to hear? I've intrigued one of my granddaughters with the story that I'm writing about um, uh, the Robin Hood era. And um, I'm trying to turn that story on its head where the merry men in suits of Lincoln Green rob from the poor and give to the rich and have to be overturned. So that's the thing that I'm working on right now. We'll see if anything happens to it. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds relevant. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, it's, it's such a joy to talk with you about this. I am thrilled that you read the story for us. I love that the fact that um, you have shared how special things happen. We call those genealogical serendipity in the genealogy world, you know, and it just, it's stuff you can't even plan. And some of the best things certainly come from that. Um, anything else you want to share? Anything else you've got coming up or where people can also find you if they want to learn more about your wonderful work? Uh, Tristan.com is the address to, uh, to use if you want to make any, uh, uh, any kind of connection for any reason at all, to buy a book, to buy a bear, or to say hello. Uh, it'll eventually reach me if it gets to Tristan.com. I'm also working on, uh, uh, a, a memoir, which is called Last Call at Jimmy Heggs, uh, which follows my father and mother's career in downtown Minneapolis as restaurant owners. They had many tales to tell, and so I'm working on that as well. Oh, how wonderful. Who knows? They may have known my uh, husband's great-grandmother was a milliner. She made hats in Minneapolis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably back around the same time, so... Probably. Maybe a connection. Tom Haig, thank you so much for being on the show, for reading your story, and for sharing your little guy, Peef. I think there's a lot of kids who could uh, benefit from that story as well this Christmas. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Lisa. What a treat. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much to Tom Haig. Um, what a treat to have him read the story. I did not know he was going to do that. <clears throat> and I'm absolutely thrilled. 
Sorry, I'm dealing with a, it's not a cold. <laughs> it's a, a bit of allergies, but um, before I let you go today, <clears throat> I want to um, give you a little bit of an update um, about things that are just happening around the cookhouse. You know, you, we've spent a lot of time together this year, and I know I've been in touch with you via the newsletter um, last week, and there was no show. So uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of update about what's been happening at our house. So last week kind of started as usual. And um, my daughter, Lacey, who is my middle daughter um, of the three, and she, many of you probably have either met her or maybe talked to her because uh, she worked here at Genealogy Gems for many years. She still comes and goes a little bit here. Um, but she has been at many of the conferences with me when I travel around in person. And um, so I know a lot of you have had a chance to talk with her. And um, she's had a long time boyfriend named Brandon. And so last week, we were really excited because Brandon called Bill and I and he asked for our blessing on uh, his upcoming proposal and their marriage. And of course, I said, of course, <laughs> he's such a wonderful guy. And um, so we were just absolutely thrilled. <clears throat> so Lacey went off to uh, Colorado for just a quick getaway weekend to meet Brandon. They, they live in different places. He's in Southern California and she's in Texas, but that will change soon enough. Um, but they met up in Colorado and had a chance to, they were, the whole idea was just to kind of go out on some adventures. And of course, we knew that there was going to be a proposal in there as well. So we were really excited when the phone rang that night, the first night, because we were going to hear about the ring and the proposal. And what we got was um, Brandon telling us that Lacey was in the intensive care unit at the local hospital. And she had been in an ATV accident. Now, <clears throat> that was news to me because they were supposed to be snowmobiling. And I guess there hadn't been enough snow really in Colorado at the time. So they ended up switching gears and the company said, hey, you know, why don't you do the ATVs? Well, they did, but of course the snow started to fall and that starts to obliterate the path that you're on. And next thing Lacey knew was that she hit just a little, a little divot that was under the snow and went flying. Now she was behind Brandon, so Brandon didn't see this at first. And she tumbled, the ATV flipped over and hit her. It was horrible. And uh, the amazing thing was, is they were up on this mountain and there's nobody around. And she's laying there by herself in the snow. And out of nowhere comes these hunters. There was a man with his daughter, his 14 year old daughter in a truck. And they were up behind her within a minute or two. Quick, Brandon quickly realized in looking back that she wasn't back there. And he came back and they just converged. At, <clears throat> she said it was really a miracle because they hadn't seen anybody the whole trip. So they managed to get her into the hunter's truck. The daughter took her ATV down, which was all mangled. And uh, they got down to base camp where the ambulance came and, of course, cut off all her designer REI snow clothes. <laughs> but that's what you have to do to check and see how you're doing. And it turned out that she had multiple pelvic fractures. Um, and also a broken wrist. So very quickly, she gets to the hospital, the ICU, and they call us. And of course, the challenge is going to be how to get her home uh, from Colorado, from Denver. So um, I emailed you guys all through the weekly newsletter, which comes out on Wednesdays usually, and um, let you know that uh, there wasn't going to be a show this week or last week, I guess it was. And I told you just really briefly what had happened. And you guys were so amazing. I heard your, your prayers just poured in. And let me tell you, for a mama bear who was stuck thousands of miles away and unable to see her daughter um, for a few days, and it was so difficult. And you guys just kept me lifted up. I want to thank you for that because it was such an encouragement. I heard from many of you that some of you have had, had similar accidents or something far worse, which is always a good reminder, no matter what's happening, that as bad as something is, there are other things that can be worse. We were thanking our lucky stars and thanking God that there was no head injury, um, that as serious as it was, you know, it could have been worse. 
and that call could have been worse. So thank you so much. And of course, what I eventually we figured out, Bill and I, that I flew out on Thursday um, and got her home on Friday, which when you have a person with a broken pelvis, that's a challenge unto itself. And she was an amazing trooper making it through TSA and all. I mean, they grilled her for way too long and tested the chair and tested her and it just went on and on. But um, she did get discharged with a walker, which you have to have a walker to be able to stand up from a wheelchair and make transitions that you need to make from sit to stand and all that. And of course, <clears throat> she needed a slew of medical equipment uh, that was not covered by insurance. Only the walker came home with her. So I um, let my my neighbor friends here in Texas just kind of know what had happened. I was heading out of town. And next thing we knew, we had a trailer full of everything we could have possibly needed. We had the portable wheelchair. We had a an amazing, practically brand new, you know, electric wheelchair. We have all the equipment we needed. Everything showed up from uh, somebody here in the neighborhood, one of our friends who had it from when uh, her mother lived with her. And it was just amazing. Um, also, two doors down, all of a sudden, we had a wheelchair accessible van. Um, their mother had passed away in the last year, and it's this beautiful and wonderful conditioned van with the motorized up and down. And, and of course, our biggest fear was how are we going to get her anywhere? How are we going to get her to doctor's appointments? She has surgery pending. And next thing we know is there's a van in our driveway. Uh, and then every every evening, quietly, meals just started showing up. I wasn't even privy to that happening until the, I opened the door and my husband said, Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> They're coming. Every single need was met and every prayer has been answered. <clears throat> And uh, it's just been amazing. I consider you guys a part of all of that happening. And um, we are just so, so grateful. At such a difficult time. It's been a difficult year. Uh, it's, it's an incredible way to close the year. But, you know, I firmly believe that anything that is hard, um, we can survive it and it can sharpen us and it makes us better people. And I really think we all become better people after the tough times, much more so than the easy times, huh? Um, but whatever happened to the proposal? Do you ask? Let me check. Okay, in chat, <laughs> I know. Okay, well, the evening before she was to be discharged, and let me see, I think I, I have permission to share this with you. <laughs> the evening before she was discharged, um, Brandon solicited all of the uh, nurses found that the lobby had a beautiful fireplace and a grand piano. He got flowers. He got Martinelli's uh, sparkling cider. They all made it happen. And he proposed. Uh, <laughs> he really did. It, it was a lifetime movie. <laughs> it's the way Lacey puts it. It was amazing. And what's so funny is that uh, she kind of suspected that there might be a proposal in the works but absolutely clueless that when he said, honey, let's get you in the wheelchair. We need to get out of this room. Let's comb your hair. No, oh, it's okay. Let's comb your hair. <laughs> and they wheeled down and went to the lobby and he proposed. And we are so, so thrilled that he is going to be our new son. So um, I just am so, again, grateful for all of your support and your kindness. Uh, through this. Yes, she's going to have wrist surgery on Monday. So she's been through the COVID test. She's clear to go. We're going to do this first thing Monday morning. So next week, I will not have a show for you. Well, I'll take a break. And um, I'm getting I'm building up my muscles because I'm moving the wheelchair and we're doing all that. And she's going to be uh, even down a little bit more recuperating with the wrist. Um, but we will be back the first of the year. And uh, I am really excited about it because uh, there's just so many good things to come. I know there are. And when people like Tom Haig make themselves available to us, we just know that we're in such good company. And there's lots of people to talk to, lots for us to share with each other. And um, I just want to thank you all. I'm looking at your chat. Oh, blessings to you too. Have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. And you saw her ring. Yes, her ring is gorgeous. And he had it custom designed and it's got little hearts on the side. This is all. 
I can't get enough of it. <laughs> so anyway, we are happy to share a wonderful outcome to a very difficult situation and our absolute intense joy. We are ending this year with great joy. Thank you so much. It has been a roller coaster, Andrew. And Andrew, I saw that people said that in, in England, you say Happy Christmas. And in America, we say Merry Christmas. I know some of you Canadians will have to tell us if it's any different in Canada. But however you say it, Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining me. And um, I'll have a little bit of show notes and stuff. I put the link in the chat for you who are here live. Um, if you wanted to get the any of Tom's books or Peef, isn't Peef adorable? I was so thrilled. That was a surprise that he uh, shared the Peef story. And um, until the new year of 2021, have a wonderful Christmas and a blessed new year. And I just cannot wait to see you and see what we have to talk about. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.